Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series that I started this last Monday talking about killing sacred cows. Now that title may not ring your bell, and if you missed my programs the first couple of days of this week, it, it could stand some explanation, but rather than me going back through all that, let me just say that uh, I'm calling some religious doctrines today sacred cows. You know, I went to India back in 1980 or 81, I think it was, and I was literally in a house holding a meeting, and of course this was in uh, Ahmedabad, India, and it was hot, and they had the doors open, and a Brahma bull walked into the house <laughs> while I was in there, and people just scattered and let it go, and I thought, why don't you shoo this cow out? Why don't you hit it, whip it, get it out or something? And they said, these are sacred cows. Over in India, I think it's the Hindus. If I'm wrong on this, please don't get on my case. There is some religious sect, I think it's Hindu, that believe in reincarnation, and they believe that, you know, I saw a little boy crumpling up rose petals and feeding ants because they could have been ancestors. They worship animals. They don't believe in killing animals. And so these cows are sacred. There's, all, there's people starving. And yet there's all of this meat on the hoof walking around and nobody will kill it because it could be somebody's aunt or uncle or who knows whatever. And so anyway, these are sacred cows and they just don't touch them. They, when they walk into a house, they just let them do whatever. They let them knock over things. Uh, they can mess right there in the house and they just clean it up, but they don't shoo them out. They just let them do whatever because they're sacred cows. I'm telling you, we have some sacred cows, religious doctrines in the body of Christ that according to Mark chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus said that these traditions and doctrines of man make the word of no effect. These doctrines are like sacred cows. People won't touch them. And so I'm just being bold and saying that these things are wrong. I countered, first of all, this extreme teaching on the sovereignty of God. Now, let me deal with a subject that, you know, I can understand how people came up with this religious doctrine because in the Old Testament, you see a wrath from God where God smites people with leprosy and hits them with the botch and the mildew and emrods. And you see a wrath and a punishment of God in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, you see a grace and a mercy of God that wouldn't have been allowed under the Old Testament. But I can see that there are people who have based their interpretation of the nature of God on the wrath and the punishment of the Old Testament. And I have met many New Testament Christians. Matter of fact, I myself was one for a period of time until I got some revelation from the Word of God that I just wasn't sure whether God was going to be mean and angry and punishing and wrath like in the Old Testament or if he was going to be like in the New Testament where he turned around and forgave a woman taken in the very act of adultery. You know, in that New Testament example, according to the Old Testament, if you caught a person in the act of adultery, you were supposed to stone both the man and the woman to death. There was a prescribed punishment. And this is the reason that the scribes and the Pharisees brought this woman to Jesus, not that because they wanted justice, but Jesus had been preaching mercy he had been preaching that you aren't under the punishment. God isn't judging you. And of course, they went back to the Old Testament and cited examples of where God sent a death angel and it went out and killed all of the Egyptians in one night. God sent an angel out and smote the Syrians, 186,000 men in one night. God smote um, the uh, king. I forget the name at this moment, so I'm not going to say just in case I make a mistake. But there was a king of Israel that went in to offer a sacrifice and it wasn't for kings to do that. And God smote him with leprosy. Uzziah, I'm pretty sure, was the king. And anyway, you cite these examples in the Old Testament of where God did this. And so these religious Pharisees were angry at Jesus for teaching that God would love a prostitute, that God would love a, a publican, a tax collector who was a traitor to the Jewish nation and also a thief. 
And Jesus was preaching the goodness of God and the mercy of God. And he went in and ate with publicans and sinners. And these religious people were just incensed that you can't do this because they wanted the harshness and the wrath of God. They wanted judgment. They believed that God was like an angry old man hanging over the rails of heaven with a lightning bolt in his hand. And if you get out of line, boom, he's going to blast you. And that's what they were preaching. And here Jesus was preaching grace. And so they brought this woman, taken in the very act of adultery, thinking that they had Jesus on the spot because if he forgave her, they had a precedent in the Old Testament that if you didn't execute this judgment, you could be put to death. And so they would be able to come against Jesus and kill him or put him in prison and silence his witness if he held to his teaching on grace. If he didn't hold to his teaching on grace because of the potential... Uh, punishment that they could execute on him. And if he went along with the Old Testament and said, yes, stone her to death according to the Old Testament law, well, then all of the people who had been drawn to Jesus by grace would leave him. So they thought they had him in a catch-22. If he stood by his teaching on grace, they could throw him in jail or kill him. If he went with the condemnation and the wrath of the Old Testament, well, then all of the people would leave him. So they thought that they had him. There's no way he could get out of this. And you know what he did? He just knelt down and wrote on the ground with his finger, and the Scripture doesn't tell us what he wrote, so I don't know what he wrote. I've got my opinions. But then he raised himself up and he said, Let him that is without sin cast the first stone. And you know what he did? He didn't say what she did was okay. He didn't say it's okay to go live in sin. So they couldn't get him on refusing to execute the judgment. He just said, Yes, she's worthy of judgment, but let him that is without sin cast the first stone. And it's my own personal opinion. Again, I'm not going to make a deal out of this, but I think that he was writing down some of their sins in the ground. He, wrote, he knelt down again, and he might have written down the name of their mistress. He might have written down the widow that they had just stolen all of her money and told you know, the children that you don't have to give you don't have to support your widowed mother. Just give the money to us, to the church. And he wrote down the name of this. Or he, he did something that these people were convicted by their own conscience and went out. And then he turned to the woman and he says, is, where are your accusers? Does no man condemn you? And she said, no man, Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, see, he said it was sin. It was wrong. But yet he extended mercy towards them. So here's this potential contradiction. Is God the God of the Old Testament that, man, when people sinned, the wrath of God fell and punishment, sickness, and disease, and God would just wipe them out? Or is He the God of the New Testament where Jesus showed mercy to this prostitute? He showed, showed mercy to publicans and sinners. Which is it? Will the real God please stand up? Does God have a split personality? And see, because people haven't been able to reconcile the Old and the New Testament and understand this, people really come up with kind of an attitude that is God merciful today or is this a day that He's in a bad mood? Is this when He's going to punish me and judge me? Or is He going to give me mercy like we see Jesus extend to so many people? And so they think that God has a split personality. They just don't know what He's like. And that religious doctrine, that sacred cow, this lack of understanding has caused many people to run away from God. It's caused many people not to draw near to Him because they just don't understand what He's like. You know, if you thought that I was the person that made every baby mentally retarded that's born that way, everyone who is sick and diseased, that, can, that has cancer or any incurable disease, if I'm the one that gave that to them, if I caused every marriage to fail and on and on, if I was guilty of the things that people are blaming God for, I mean, even in our contracts, it'll say you're insured barring an act of God, such as a hurricane, a tornado, a flood, or whatever. And they, they put it in their contracts that these are acts of God, that God causes it. If I was guilty of everything that God is, is being blamed for, there isn't a civilized nation on the face of the earth that wouldn't put me to death. Or if they've outlawed the death penalty, they'd put me away and throw away the key. There isn't a civilized society that would tolerate things like that. And yet, religion is representing God 
as the source of all of this wrath and punishment. And it's giving people a wrong impression. It is, it, it's, it's um, a criticism against God that is unjust. And so some of you are listening and saying, well, what's the answer? There are examples of the wrath of God. Again, I'm going to offer some materials that will go into much more detail on this, and I encourage you to get those materials. But the quick answer, I'm just going to deal with this today, the rest of today, and then tomorrow's broadcast is all I'm going to do and deal with this. But the quick answer on this is that in the Old Testament, God held people's sins against them and dealt with sin very harshly because people could not be born again their heart couldn't be changed. They, and some people won't understand this, I hadn't got time to defend it, but they, in a sense, weren't able to perceive spiritual things the way that we are now. There's a scripture that backs that up, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that says, The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. People in the Old Testament were only natural men. They weren't born again. They didn't have the Spirit of God living on the inside of them. They didn't have the Holy Spirit quickening them. Or another way of saying it is they didn't have this internal guidance that a born-again believer does today. So how did you control them? Well, it's real simple. Even a lost man can understand you do this and bam, here's the wrath of God. Here's the punishment of God. And a carnal person, a person that has no spiritual discernment can understand that if I touch this fire, it burns, and man, they pull their hand back. They feel pain, and it makes them recoil and go away from it. Before God could bring Jesus to this earth and produce the new birth, which put God on the inside of us and gave us a supernatural ability to understand things that Old Testament people couldn't, before that time, the Old Testament people had to be corrected and in a sense herded towards God by external things such as punishment, justice, and reaping what they've sown and things like this. A co another comparison that might help understand this, it's like um, children when they're young. You can't reason with a one-year-old or a two-year-old the way that you do a 20-year-old. And, of course, now this isn't um, commonly accepted. Most people have thrown away the Bible's method of instructing children. And they believe that it's terrible to spank a child or to do anything like that. The Bible says that if you love your child, you will chasten him betimes. The rod and reproof gives wisdom and on and on. And, and the Scriptures teach that there should be corporal, physical punishment for children when they're young. And the reason is because they don't have the ability to reason and understand things. If you go to a one-year-old and you say, if you take that toy from your brother or sister, then you know what you're doing? You're yielding to Satan because Satan is the one who takes. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Covetousness, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, is idolatry. You, in a sense, are worshiping yourself and putting yourself and your own interest ahead of everybody else. See, if you try and reason with a one-year-old and tell them that, they aren't going to get that. If you tell them that because this is the devil that's inspiring you to be selfish and to take this toy, then you are becoming controlled by the devil. And if you do that, if you're just selfish, nobody's going to like you. Aren't, you aren't going to have friends. If you get a job, when you grow up and get a job, you aren't going to be able to keep your job because you're only thinking about yourself. You won't be thinking about your employer. You won't be a good customer relations person. When you get married, your marriage won't last because you're a self-centered person and you're going to destroy your marriage. Try and tell those things to a one-year-old. They don't have the ability to comprehend that. But you know what a one-year-old can comprehend? You go over there and take that toy again, and I'm going to spank you. And they may not even know that there is a God or devil that is trying to influence them. They may not realize there is a heaven or a hell. They may have never thought about marriage. They don't have that concept. They aren't thinking about getting a job. They don't understand any of those things, but they understand if I go take that toy again, I'm going to get spanked. And they'll say no. When the thought comes to them, when the devil tries to tempt them and draw them away, you can literally get a baby, a young child, 
to resist the devil of fear of consequences, corporal punishment. But you know what? That's only temporary. You don't do that forever. You know, when I was a little kid, we lived on a busy city street. And I mean, my mother, she threatened my life a hundred times, if once, about you look both ways before you cross that street. And you know, to this day, I'm 60 years old today. If I go to cross the street, I'll look two or three times. I mean, she grounded into me. I got whooped. I got whooped, beat. Some people today would say, well, that's terrible. You know, it's because my mother loved me and she didn't want me to be killed. And when I was a kid, I wouldn't cross the street without looking both ways a number of times, not because I was smart enough to process what being hit by a car would do to me. I didn't really think about that. You know why I did it? Because of fear of my mother. And yet that fear of my mother kept me in check and kept me alive until I got old enough to understand that it's really not about my mother punishing me. It's about me not being hit by a car or by a truck. Now I can reason it out. Now I understand the real reason to look both ways before you cross the street. But there was a time that I didn't use the right reasoning. It was that fear of being punished that made me do the right thing. And that's the way that you should train up a child. You don't, when they're 20 years old, hopefully, it's not because they're afraid that their mother is going to spank them that they look both ways before they cross the street. But when they're young, that's the first motivation that you use, and it preserves their life. There was an instance where my oldest son, Joshua, he was just a year old, and he was uh, running down a dirt road in front of us, and there was these uh, weeds that had grown up that were taller than him. And we were walking, and he was in front of us, I don't know, 20 or 30 yards or something, just running down this dirt road. And hardly anybody ever came down that dirt road. And all of a sudden, we saw the dirt coming up, and a car must have been going, I mean, on this little tiny dirt road that if people did come down it, normally they were going 10 miles an hour. Somebody must have been going 50 or 60 miles an hour. I mean, they were just speeding down there, and they were going to intersect with my son at that intersection. And he was coming so fast, I didn't have time to physically run and grab him and hold him and stop him. But because we had been spanking him, because we did use corporal punishment, because we loved him and we had taught him no, and we had taught him stop, and we had taught him to obey us, not just because we sat down and reasoned it out with him. He just was afraid of getting a spanking. Because we had trained him, I was able to yell at him and say, Joshua, stop. And I mean, boom, just like that. A one-year-old just stopped his running because we had trained him, and that car came by and missed him just by inches. We saved his life. There's a lot of people that think, well, that's terrible that you'd spank. Oh, so you just let him go, and you have to reason everything, or you have to have one of these leashes thing where you treat your children like a dog and keep them on a leash because you haven't corrected them. Amen. I know a lot of you are really blessed by what I'm saying, but I'm just telling you that you can sit here and reason it away. Oh, I love my child too much. Oh, you love them so much that you aren't going to teach them right from wrong. You're going to wait until they're old enough to think and reason before they start acting right. And that's what causes the terrible twos. And that's what causes a lot of the rebellion and a lot of the things that we see today is because the parents didn't love their children enough to spank them and to tell them what was wrong. Just like the old saying that all of us have probably heard a million times when the parent says, this hurts me more than it does you, and then they give you a spanking. The little kid doesn't understand that, but once you become a parent, it's absolutely true. If you love your children, you don't enjoy hitting them. You don't slap them across the face or kick them or burn them or do anything like that. God gave you extra padding on a certain part of your body that if it's applied correctly, it won't do any damage. It's not child abuse, and it will save their souls from hell. That's what the Scripture says. You have to chasten your son betimes. The word betimes means early, when they're young. If you wait until they're two to start trying to correct them, then's when you have the terrible twos. If you wait until they're teenagers before you start putting restrictions on them, that's why you have so much rebellion. I'm telling you, the Scripture says that we should be able to correct our children. Anyway, 
I got a little caught up on that, but the reason I was using that example is to say that before people got born again, in a sense, they were like little children that could not understand spiritual things. You may not recognize it, but being born again gives you a spiritual aptitude that people who aren't born again don't have. And prior to Jesus coming, people in the Old Testament who loved God and sought God did not have the same aptitude, the same ability to understand and be governed by the grace of God. And so God used the Old Testament law like we use a spanking for our children. Before they get old enough to understand, you use corporal punishment to steer them in the right direction. And in a sense, that's what the Old Testament law did. It gave these punishments and things, not because that is really the nature of God. Again, you could relate this to ch training a child. When you spank a child, the child could take that as my dad hit me, my dad hates me. They could take that from it. But the truth is that the reason you were spanking them is because you love them and you don't want them to go out and do the wrong thing and let Satan destroy their life. And it's because you love them that you're doing this. But it could be misunderstood. Likewise, the wrath that was vented in the Old Testament has been misunderstood, and religion has come along with these doctrines, these sacred cows that I'm trying to destroy, and tells you that it's God's will to punish you. It's God that did this. He did it in the Old Testament, and likewise, God is doing this to you. No, there is a total difference now. You don't deal with things the same. In the Old Testament, if a child cursed their father or mother, the parent had to correct them, and if they did it a second time, they had to bring them to the elders of the town, and then the parents had to be the first ones to cast a stone, and they stoned those children to death. So in the Old Testament, if a child cursed their father or mo mother and continued to do it, the ultimate punishment was death. We don't do that in the New Testament. You know why? Because in the Old Testament, people couldn't be born again. They couldn't be changed. And according to 1 Samuel chapter 15, I believe it's around verse 22, it says, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Today, we value things differently, and we just think, oh, this rebellion and teenage stuff, it's all normal. The Bible says it's witchcraft, it's idolatry, it's demonic. And in the New Covenant, people can be changed. Their heart can be changed. In the Old Testament, once a person got a demon, you couldn't cast it out. They couldn't be born again. Deliverance hadn't come. If a person went as far as to be demon-possessed, it was like a cancer. The best thing you could do is just cut it out. So in the Old Testament, you killed people who became demon-possessed. In the New Testament, now that Jesus has come and now that God can change your heart and Satan's dominion can be broken, we don't kill children when they curse their parents. Instead, we continue to love them and tell them about the goodness of God, and if they'll receive it, they can be changed and set free. We don't kill our children the way it was prescribed in the Old Testament. There's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. God doesn't have a split personality. There's a reason why things were the way that they were. You know, I'm out of time today, but I will continue this on our program tomorrow, so I encourage you to listen in. Also, listen as our announcer gives you some information about how you can get this teaching on killing sacred cows or this individual teaching uh, that I've entitled A Split Personality. Andrew's complete teaching titled Killing Sacred Cows was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD for 16 pounds. Request item T1063C for the CD, T3207D for the live DVD, or you can get a DVD as seen on TV for seven pounds. Request item T1063D for the As Seen on TV DVD when you contact us. This series is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awme.net and click on MP3 downloads on the left hand side of the page. The second teaching in the Killing Sacred Cows series titled Split Personality is available on CD for three pounds. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will send this second CD free of charge when you write or call. On today's program, Andrew mentioned his teaching titled, The True Nature of God. 
This product is available on CD for 16 pounds. Request CD album T1002C. To write us, use the address on your screen. If you prefer, you can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. If the lines are busy, you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. We hope to hear from you today. We'd also like to remind you that Andrew's latest book titled Living in the Balance of Grace and Faith is available in hardback for £12.50. Request book T228. I know that many of you today can see the benefit of what I'm saying. You can see how it sets you free. You see the potential of it for setting other people free from just all the religious observances and getting really into the reality of a relationship with Christ. And I tell you, I'm excited about this. We are reaching as far with the gospel as we can. We have a number on your screen and you can call and get information about becoming a Gospel Truth Partner today. If you're a regular viewer of Gospel Truth or you've seen our Destiny Stories DVD series, you're familiar with Leland Shores. Leland heard from God, pursued his destiny, graduated from Karis Bible College and moved to Uganda, Africa to fulfill the plan of God for his life. This past summer, Leland and his new wife, Carol, returned to Colorado Springs to attend the 2009 Summer Family Bible Conference, where Leland had the honor of speaking before his mentors at CBC. God has an opinion of us, and he has honored us, but he acknowledged us. He has acknowledged us. He has set us apart. Hallelujah. So that we can boast and glorify him. We can't glorify God unless we've received His glory. And it is not a robe. It is a position. Leland and Carol are back in Uganda and are currently in the process of establishing a Karis Bible College program in that African nation. Be sure and keep them in your prayers as they continue walking in the destiny that God has prepared for them. The Lord is really prospering this ministry, and one of, the, one of the ways that we're touching people is through our Karis Bible College. And this year we have around 500 students just in our Colorado Springs branch of the Karis Bible College. We have 13 Bible colleges scattered worldwide. We have hundreds or thousands of people taking it by correspondence. And I tell you, God is changing people's lives. If you really want to get hold of these truths, I tell you, the Karis Bible Colleges are the best way that I have of doing that. So we have a number on your screen. I encourage you to call, get information, find out how you can enroll either in one of these schools physically or by correspondence and take advantage of the Karis Bible Colleges.